Welcome to the Dr. Lori Morris podcast, where she interviews experts in health and science, sharing their expertise so you can live your healthiest life. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by Fit Vegan Coaching, the world's leading whole food plant-based body recomposition program for Gen X and baby boomers. Founded by Maxime, whose personal journey began after losing his ex fiance to breast cancer, Fit Vegan Coaching is on a mission to disease-proof the world through the transformative power of plant-based eating and fitness. This program is a Rolls Royce of plant-based coaching, offering all-inclusive services, personalized plans, world-class accountability, lifelong support, and more. Say goodbye to the yo-yo dieting and embrace a lasting transformation that will rev up your metabolism even post-transformation. Ready to take charge of your health and vitality? Head over to fitvegan.ca. That's fitvegan.ca. And mention Dr. Lori for exclusive bonus savings when you sign up. Don't miss this opportunity to join the movement towards a healthier, fitter, and more vibrant you. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by The Healing Kitchen, your path to vibrant health. Immerse yourself in the transformative program. Guided by the combined expertise of myself, Dr. Lori Marbus, and Chef Brittany Giroudi, who has lost 70 pounds on a whole food plant-based diet. Here's what's in store for you. Virtual weekly sessions. Engage in an immersive 60-minute virtual session every single week, where you'll delve into the world of wholesome plant-based goodness right from your own kitchen. Cooking with Brittany the first half hour. Unleash your inner chef as you're captivated by Chef Brittany Giroudi's culinary mastery that will delight your taste buds and nourish your body. Medical Q&A with Dr. Lori the last half hour. Prioritize your well-being during the second half hour. I will personally address your medical inquiries, providing evidence-based insights and personalized advice, empowering you to make informed choices for your health. So join us on the Healing Kitchen to help you step into a healthier and most vibrant future. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and today two amazing people Oh my goodness, Dr. Neil Bernard and Steph Dagnofo, how are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you so much. Super to see you, Lori. Oh, it is such a delight always to talk to you. And so I've interviewed Stephanie before and Dr. Bernard. I mean, I've lost count of how many times we've talked. Um, so I'm this is an amazing book that we have coming out. And I think people, it's gonna be very, very timely, especially with on the heels of the GLP-1 and those type of different medications called the Power Foods Diet. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you can see it in the background there, Dr. Bernard. So maybe we can just start, uh, Dr. Bernard, with your the book here and kind of give us the framework of it. And then we're going to bring in Stephanie's story, which is incredible in and of its own. But uh, take it away. Well, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Lori, for for um, talking about this topic. You know, there has been a, a shift over time. It used to be if you needed to lose some weight, what would you do? Well, go on a really low calorie diet. So I'm gonna try to eat 800 calories a day and that's punishing to do. And there are still plenty of people who re recommend that approach, but you know, by Wednesday, you're ready to eat the sofa. You know, it's just like, and then of course, if you go off the diet, you, you, who do you blame? You don't blame the diet. You blame yourself. You know, other people could do it. There's something wrong with me. And that's not a good thing to carry with you, but but that's the message. And okay, um, I'll try low carb. But now if I want an apple or a banana or an orange, I feel guilty. If I want a piece of bread, if I want some potatoes, if I want some cake, I want, you know, pasta, all these things are off. And if you, if you have them, you feel guilty again. So anyhow, there has, there has been, a, I think, a healthy shift toward thinking of, of diet patterns as mattering more than, than the idea of just starving yourself. Um, and that's good. And, and so, as we all know, a plant-based diet is, is a good pattern uh, as opposed to an animal-based diet. However, within all of this, there are certain foods that really are standouts. And I thought, isn't it cool that certain foods kind of tame your appetite? Or there are certain foods that do ramp up your metabolism a bit. And there are some foods that trap calories so you can't absorb them. I thought, that's amazing. What if we actually make them into breakfast and lunch and dinner and 
turned it into a carrot cake or French toast or whatever it is. And the, the beauty of this, the, the kind of the reason behind this book is so many people think of a healthy diet as maybe deprivation or I won't have the things I love. But for so many of us, it is exactly the opposite. It opens a door to a new way of thinking about food and frankly, to foods that are better than what I ate before. Um, and so that is the idea, abundance, fun. The food, the, I got to tell you, the food photographs by Dustin Harder, they, they, do, they do kind of verge toward food porn a little bit, I'd have to say. <laughs> And, and that's that's the idea. Let's have fun with it, oh, and the food and the and the food's bringing the power. So that's what that's what the book's about. So I could say so many things about food porn, um, but anyway. So you know, hey, if that's your thing, you guys at least just go get the books and look at the pretty picture. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Um, so I think this is really important, right, to show that you know, you, you can lose weight and not feel deprived, right? And really focusing in on, you know, like you, like the parts here we have, how foods cause weight loss. And one of the stories in the book speaks to how she always felt deprived. And now she does feel that abundance. It's such an important piece because it's so freeing. Um, and then how you get started and all the lovely menus and just amazing things. So Stephanie, maybe we can highlight a little bit because you're you're in the book as well. Can you speak to your story? And then we can kind of talk about maybe the different parts of the, you know, the foods, like the satiety and the right. benefits and all those things. Yeah. Of course. And Lori, thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Bernard, for the book. Um, it really is a very common story. I, I think it's, I struggled mo most of my life with my weight. Um, I grew up learning about diets very young, starvation diets, cabbage food diets. Um, nothing really worked. I was considered the chunky kid by third grade. Um, restricting food was a common thing in my house. You know, don't eat too much, you know, stuff like that. As I got older, the weight just kept creeping up. There was really nothing I could do to get it back down. It seemed like every year, even through high school, I was getting a little bigger, a little, a little, a little bit more bigger. By the time I was 21, I was over 200 pounds. I was being told I should be put on blood pressure medications, that this was hereditary, you know, and that there was nothing I could do about it. That was just 21. It just kept on going. By the time I had gotten married, I got down to 173 or 174, I think. And I thought, this is great. You know, this is like the lowest I've been in ages. Um, but then, of course, the pregnancy, the first one, I, I got up to about 280. And even after I gave birth, I was still 280. You know, it didn't go away. It was, it was just really hard to get that weight down. I was getting sicker, we, you know, I was hearing things like autoimmune. Now I was dealing with cholesterol issues. Um, the diets didn't stop every day. I would wake up and say, today's the day, you know, whether it be counting points, measuring my food, weighing my food, restricting carbs. I didn't know I could eat this many carbs, by the way, I love this and it, <laughs> for that itself. Um, but it was all about restricting, cutting back, starving, um, packaged foods, you know, and I realized even if I lost weight, it wasn't helping any of the diseases that continued to creep up as I was going along. Um, I started with knee problems in my late twenties and, you know, once you have one injury, it's, it just seemed like everything started falling apart. I just assumed, well everybody else is kind of, you know, going through this diets and fad diets and medications. And as we got older, I just thought we were supposed to get bigger and that being sick was part of getting older. But of course, all that changed when I thought this was a bad idea. <laughs> My daughter came home one day. I was, um, hearing her talk about wanting to go vegan and I understood the ethical part of it. So I understood what she was going to do, but as a mother, I was just absolutely terrified that where was she going to get her protein? Where was she going to get her calcium? So just like 
most people, I wasn't aware that we could get these things from plants. So once I did a little research, I thought, okay, actually I watched about five minutes of forks over knives and I thought, that's great. She's going to be fine. We'll let this fad do its thing and hopefully it'll be over soon. Um, but it didn't end that way. Six months after she had started going vegan, John and I, my husband, were coming home from our ninth surgery in 11 months. I mean, I was at the doctor's office every week saying, what's wrong with me? Um, we were having procedures for honestly everything. I had just failed this, my last stress test, which I had to do laying down. I couldn't even do that on the treadmill. I was in that kind of a condition. So um, I failed my last stress test. John was finishing up this surgery. Nobody could uh, explain why I was getting sicker and more uncomfortable. I had a lot of acid reflux problems, pancreatitis, diverticulitis. I had suffered from migraines since I could remember. No matter how much weight I lost, I would gain it back. And all these problems were still there. So at this moment where we were coming in, uh, coming home from that surgery, uh, we realized that the surgery didn't go as planned. John was self-employed. Um, he wasn't going to be able to work and I wasn't working. I was ready to file for disability at 42 years old. I was going to start the process with my permanent handicap placard, um, my facing double knee replacements. And I remembered watching that couple minutes of forks over knives and I thought, Maybe if I lose a little weight, you know, when we get home, we'll watch this documentary, but maybe I'll lose a little weight. Maybe I'll be able to, you know, get some work going or help out somehow. But once I started watching it, I gathered the family around and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is so much more. You know, I was freaked out, honestly, when I started hearing all the foods I was bringing home for my family. We're going to create all these problems I had. I didn't want to see my kids go through that. They already were starting to have these dietary habits in place from, from what I learned. So the next day I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to buy rice. I'm going to buy beans in a can. I'm going to buy all these vegetables. And, and we were really what I considered a healthy family. We didn't eat red meat except for a holiday. It was always lean chicken, you know, skinless chicken, the frozen bags we would buy by the case and, and ground turkey. I cooked dinner every day. We ate lots of fruit, actually. We didn't dine out because we knew that was a problem for us. You know, if we were to go out, it was just worse. So as a mom, I thought I was doing all the right things, cooking meals, putting those little green beans next to the mashed potatoes with all the butter on top. Um, but it changed. It changed as soon as I watched the movie. And the next day, we didn't know what the heck we were doing. I didn't even know how to cook broccoli without butter. But I thought, let's give this a shot and see how this works. Because I didn't want to see my kids go through what I was already experiencing. So 10 months in, we ended up losing 250 pounds, but getting there was a really cool, really cool thing to do. My kids kind of like to cook. One was into sushi. So he was making sushi rolls all the time, vegetarian. Um, and then the other one was always watching cooking shows. So she was very excited to get in and, you know, put seasonings on what she was actually more willing to try seasonings than me. I was nervous. You know, one way of cooking, 40 years, you get stuck. How do you cook without oil? How do you cook without butter? But we just jumped right in. Lots of soups, lots of stir fries, and lots of pasta. And the weight was coming off with everything that I was told not to do. We were shocked. We were absolutely shocked. Um... Within weeks, I had to, uh, actually, within weeks, I started getting really tired. So I had this really big boost of energy right away, you know, and all of a sudden I was extremely lethargic. I called my doctor. I said, you know, I've tried, I'm trying this new thing with these uh, plant-based, you know, eating plants. He, he, over the phone started telling me, you know, to cut back my um, high blood pressure medication. I had 
already quit taking a bunch of other stuff right away. I was so hopeful, like, okay. And within days, my hand started, you know, stopped hurting. Um, it took a little while for the esophagus stuff to be under control, but everything just started weaning off. It was actually, um, my neighbors were a little bit nervous though. So here we were all losing weight. We looked completely different. I was talking about all this medication that I wasn't taking anymore. Um, people at the bank thought that I was sick and then I had cancer or something. So people started talking about this within my small community. So I went to the doctor and I said, you know, I'm really worried. You know, I've lost so much weight. I've never had this happen. When I got to 30 pounds, I thought, that's it. That's all I lose is 30 pounds and my diets are usually over. But this just kept on going. So here I'm thinking I'm going to get into my skinny pants. Those went super quick. It just kept on going. I ended up going to the doctor and I said, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm, I'm losing so much weight. People are a little freaked out. They've never seen me like this. I've never seen me like this. You're going to have to run some labs or something because maybe I'm doing something. Maybe I'm hurting myself eating all these fruits and vegetables. I mean, my grandmother was going through cancer. They were telling her not to eat fruits and, you know, fruits like that. So the messages were getting very confusing. My labs were great, by the way. Um, said in 20 years, they've never looked so good. And I just wanted to keep this going for my family. I thought that they were going to get heart disease because I had it. You know, I thought they were going to get diabetes because other family members had it. But what we really learned is it wasn't about dieting. It was putting those power foods right on our plate, those fruits, vegetables, grains, pastas, potatoes. I didn't even make a sweet potato until 2013. Just there was so much more out there that we didn't know. And I just continued to hype it up. My kids lost weight. They were sleeping better. Their work was better. Their mood was better. My husband lost weight. He was feeling better. It just... Lori, you know, it doesn't stop after that. You just want everybody to feel this good. Mm. So that's how that's how that started. Just a little thing. Okay, so 250 pounds, that was the whole family, right? Because I, I love your picture of your whole family, like your before and after pictures that you have. Yeah. It's in 10 months. So how much weight did you individually lose? I lost 100 pounds in that 10 months. And it I've never seen anything like this happen. I didn't think I could get... The lowest I had ever gone was that 170-ish around my wedding. And my the lowest out of every diet I've ever done. New, can I mention the diets? Sure. Okay. Nutrisystem, Diet Center, Weight Watchers, Keto, South Beach, Cabbage, Cabbage Soup Diet, Shredded Wheat Diet, if, Starvation Diet, <laughs> Slim Fast Diet. Um, nothing did what this did. It wasn't about weight within days. It was about, wow, I can't believe how I feel. My clear headed thinking, the ideas I wanted to do, the getting up and moving around again. 100 pounds in 10 months is how fast that came off. Eating more foods than I've ever eaten. The opposite of everything I've been told. Wow. So that a story is one of many, right, Dr. Richard? So, I mean, you guys do research at the Bernard Medical Center in DC. So can we kind of just talk to like how do foods actually cause weight loss because we see this these wonderful examples and this is a very common theme like these these are the potential side effects they're like everybody's side effects like side effects, yeah. why is that <laughs> yes well our research team has been doing lots and lots of studies we've had thousands of people come through and we're actively involved in several big studies right now but um, let me maybe give a little credit where credit is due. There, Lots of researchers have been looking in this area. And the Harvard research team back in 2015 did a really interesting study. They, they studied more than 100,000 people, tracked their diets over time. And then they tracked their weight as the years went by. And they discovered that the more you ate of certain specific foods, um, the more weight people lost. And they identified what the foods actually were. Now, there are whole patterns that are good, and, and I want to talk to you about that, Laurie, but but first, let me just throw some praise to certain exact foods. At the very top of the Harvard list of the foods that caused the most weight loss were these humble, little, unassuming blueberries and strawberries and raspberries, these little tiny berries that I guess I knew about, but they weren't really a big part of my diet. 
Um, and the question then was why? And a blueberry it gets its color from anthocyanins. That's nature's painting box. So they're antioxidants. And some of them are reddish, like in a strawberry. Some of them are kind of purplish. And in October, when the leaves here turn yellow and orange, those are a different kind of anthocyanin. So, so don't eat the leaves on the trees, but but the um, the blueberries and the strawberries you can. So two years after that study came out, researchers in the UK brought in 2,700 twins, twin identical twins. And they did DEXA scans, so, so you could measure how much body fat they had and where it was on their body. And they discovered something amazing, that the twin who ate the most anthocyanins had substantially less body fat and specifically less abdominal fat compared to her genetically identical sister. So it wasn't genes, it was something about what they're eating. And then we learned that the anthocyanins seem to boost metabolism. But I think they have other effects apart from that. But anyway, so that got us going. And then in the other direction, there's a bunch of spices. Um, hot peppers, you already know that they induce thermogenesis. You know, you start to sweat a little bit when you eat your jalapeno. Um, ginger will do some of this. But cinnamon is this funny thing that researchers have been studying. It triggers the release of a little bit of adrenaline that raises your metabolism. Okay, so I thought this is this is a start. And I worked with Dustin and Lindsay, the recipe developers, Dustin Harder, genius uh, recipe developer, and Lindsay S. Nixon, who is just the greatest. And so Dustin came up with blueberry cinnamon syrup, which there's like, it's just blueberries, a little bit of vanilla, some cinnamon, and you could put some maple syrup in there. And then Lindsay came up with some French toast. Okay, this is not your grandma's French toast because it's not all buttery and laden with eggs, but it has some cinnamon too. Okay, so you're making your breakfast and it's like the most indulgent thing in the world. Um, and you lose weight with it. And so that was one of our starters, but we came up with 120 others. And they're things like a, a Southwest chili, which is just delicious. You can make extra and your whole family will, will love it or pasta. So many dieters are afraid of pasta. You know, it's carbs. Well, we've got a pasta arrabbiata, you know, that's Italian for angry, uh, but uh, to a chef, it means spicy. And it's just like delicious and carrot cakes for dessert. Now, don't get me wrong. These are not grease covered things that if you put on a napkin, like it soaks with grease. These are health healthy, but tasty. And my hope is you will never count calories. You will never weigh your meals. And most importantly, I want people never, ever to blame themselves for what happened with a bad diet because it was never your fault. And when people lose this weight and they feel great, the healing has to start. And we have to start forgetting all of those times where we beat ourselves up and other people beat us up. And um, we've got to just unguilt this thing and let the health come back. No, that's exactly right. There's so many, uh, like I literally just had a patient today who, you know, she's telling me why she keeps failing and it's always blaming herself and all the stress. And like, anyway, it's just, it was heartbreaking. And so um, you're exactly right. This is a very common element is that people do feel shame and guilt because they're like, I just failed one more time. But here's a delicious way to one, feel better and reverse the chronic diseases that you're dealing with but also allow yourself to understand it wasn't you to begin with. It's the environment we're living in. It's a very different one than our natural one, like two, 300 years ago. But, you know, what is it? So you said a little bit about these foods that one are, can be delicious and made into these amazing recipes and a little bit about, about the berries and thermogenesis and stuff. But what about the other foods? Because I know that study from Harvard in 2015 also talked about cruciferous vegetables and green leafy vegetables. And then your legumes, amazing, you know, citrus, melon, like where and exactly here, like, what are we looking at here? What are all the, the levers that are being pulled by these incredible foods? Okay, three main ones. Um, and we, back in 2005, we published one of our first big studies on this, where we brought in a group of women, they were all after the age of menopause, and had done the, the diets that Stephanie was talking about, and, and feeling really stuck. And so we randomly assigned half of them to, to follow what at the time was a healthy diet, you know, white meat, that chicken, that kind of stuff. 
The other half, no animal products. And we kept oils really low. But we said, no limit on calories. Those are the only rules. No animal products, keep oils low. And by the way, I have to tell you, when you do a study like this, you set rules. But there are some unexpected things that happen. About week three of the study, one of the participants discovered that Twizzlers have no animal products in them and are low in fat. And she made, <laughs> and she made sure to share this information with all the other research research participants. So, okay, anyway, but you, you have to be honest. You know, you do your study, you stick with your rules. So my low-fat, vegan, Twizzler-fueled research participants, um, they lost weight, um, mm -hmm. a lot of weight. And, and, and But if you ask them, they say, no, I'm eating a normal portion. I'm not, I'm not starving at all. I'm eating as much as I want. And their carb intake went, went up because they're eating rice and beans and everything else. What is actually happening, the, the first thing is, that's happening is you're eating more fiber because cheese, salmon, chicken, it doesn't have any fiber at all. You replace them with beans, vegetables, they have fiber. Fiber has almost no calories, but it's very filling. And so you think you're eating the same amount, but you're just not. Secondly, you're letting your carbohydrate increase. Carbohydrate has only four calories in a gram compared to any kind of fat or oil, which has nine. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong. You're not slathering butter and oil all over your foods, um, but the, the foods are just naturally not very calorie dense. So the first thing is that your appetite is tamed. You reach satiety with two or 300 calories less. But then there's, there's one more thing. Well, a couple more things. Um, but all the people in this study, we measured their metabolism. And what you do is you sit in a chair and I put a mask on you. You feel like an astronaut. I'm, 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 I'm measuring your oxygen intake and I'm measuring your carbon dioxide output. And with some simple arithmetic, I can tell you your metabolic rate. And then I will give you a test meal and your metabolism will change based on what you eat. So if that test meal is butter, no change. If I give you three pats of butter, no change. If I give you the whole darn stick of butter or two sticks, nothing happens. Fat, fatty foods just don't bump your metabolism up. You don't burn calories faster. But foods with a lot of carbohydrate in them and foods that have plant protein in them, your metabolism goes up for about three or four hours. And But the best news is, as you stick with this, your body is transforming. And as the fat comes out of your muscle cells, they are more supercharged as burners of calories. And so after 14 weeks, that burn that they got from the test meal was augmented by about 15% more um, afterwards. And then we tracked these same people for the next two years after the study ended. They never put back the weight. They, they were continuing to get skinnier. And so we repeated that uh, a couple of years ago and published it in JAMA Network Open with a much larger group. And so, so the appetite taming is part of it. The other part is your body burns calories much more effectively. And that part is worth about 200 calories a day. Uh, the appetite taming, another two or 300 calories a day. And, and, the, and there's more to it, but, but maybe that's enough for, for the moment. <laughs> so there's... It's multifaceted and they are synergistic. So you feel better, anti-inflammatory, you're seeing blood sugars improve, you're losing weight, you're moving more, you're sleeping better. So again, for me, that's one thing that patients really honed in on. It was much more than just the weight loss. And Stephanie, maybe you, you can highlight this because I know what your work is now. Maybe we can talk about that as well. But it's just how good they feel. They're like, this is normal? What? They never felt so good and they didn't understand that's the normal state of the human body should be feeling. So Stephanie, can you talk a little bit about the, just the joy of what you were feeling? I think that's so powerful. There was, honestly, there was nothing like it. And it is repeated. Like you said, when you're working with people and they do this, they validate that for you. There's something that comes over you, the end between the energy, um, the clear thinking, it, it comes on very rapidly um, it makes sense though, with all the fiber, when I'm listening to you talk about it, Dr. Barnard, you know, I was putting the potatoes on the plate. I was putting the meat on the plate. I was putting the little bit of green beans on the plate. And today these foods are 
copious amounts of greens and lentils and brown rice and no wonder we were so hungry. So once you're filled and you have all this nutrients and vitamins and minerals coursing through, you feel it. You feel it. Nourish to flourish. Absolutely. It, mm. it I love that. That's amazing. I love that saying. <laughs> I, every once in a while, I'll be interviewing someone and they'll say, like, you know, like, I will be stealing it. I will give you credit, <laughs> but I will steal it. <laughs> um, so can we talk a little bit about your work, Stephanie, and what you do with Pico? Because I think that's really, a, it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. Thank you. Well, um, when this all started, I, I, you know, I'm surrounded by sick people and I just thought, Hey, you guys, you know, check this out. Let me show you what we've been doing. Come on over. Let me start cooking for you, having you over and seeing how this, this tasted. I wanted to break the stereotype that I had, you know, right away when we think vegan or plant-based, it's like, Oh, what are you eating carrots? And you're just eating hummus. So knowing that I have that approach, I wanted to kind of make a comeback and say, I get it. I know you think that this is just carrots and hummus, but watch this lasagna that I'm going to make or this amazing, um, we had this baked potato soup, it seemed like every single week where it was just potatoes, carrots, onions, and celery and mixed together, it blended up perfect. So I started having people over, um, just cooking them some meals. The response to that was wonderful. They were willing to try it. They felt hopeful. They saw us, not just me, but they saw the whole family do it. So then I thought, well, I better tell more people because I think everybody should feel this good. I suffered for so long. We ended up as a family kind of starting the nonprofit Plantspiration. What started off as, as cooking classes quickly grew, and so did my passion for nutrition education and being able to explain to people exactly what's going on because we're really not being taught this in school. My doctor wasn't sharing with me this kind of stuff. I would have been so grateful to have somebody like you guys, you know, say, hey, this is an option for you. If you're up for it, let's give it a try. But there's not a lot of that out there. So I built up not just my muscles while I was working out, feeling so good. I built up the nutrition education, um, became an, a, a, a food for life instructor. And then that changed everything. You know, once I had this amazing curriculum, 20 year evidence-based information, now it wasn't just on me. I had this massive curriculum to bring back to everybody. And so then the classes started there. Um, I completed the lifestyle medicine coaching program. So then I started bringing in all the facets that I understood why we were getting better sleep, why we were having more activity and why it was keeping things so successful for my family. Um, we didn't own bikes before. Um, we have bikes now. The first year we had a ping pong table um, in the, in the place of the kitchen table. We actually swapped out our kitchen table for the ping pong table because we just wanted to keep moving and, and living life. I missed out on a lot of stuff. I didn't want to see people miss out on that anymore. So we started the nonprofit, started the cooking classes, um, support groups, and just brought people together so that they could learn to do this together. We, we need to see more of this for sure. Mm, no, that's fantastic. No, the Food for Life program I've been through myself, I think it was 2015, if I recall, uh, it's an amazing program and again, comes from the Bernard Medical Center. But Dr. Bernard, I want to highlight too, some of the things that we see in, you know, celebrities endorsing and they're losing weight and yada is the GLP-1. So why is this approach, eating a whole food plant-based diet, particularly certain, certain foods to help with weight loss, a better approach than taking some medications that can see rapid weight loss as well? Well, yes, we've seen over the last year or year and a half or so a huge push for semaglutide in particular, which is marketed as Ozempic for diabetes and the same drug is marketed as Wagovi for overweight, as you know. And there's been a big push for it and, and it, it does cause weight loss. But let's back up. What's it doing? Your body naturally produces GLP-1. It's, you know, Novo Nordisk didn't invent GLP-1. It is in your digestive tract. And when you eat food, if you depending on what you eat, the GLP-1 comes out into your blood and it goes up to your brain and the GLP-1 attaches to a little receptor and says, hey, I'm eating now. 
and food is here so you don't have to be hungry anymore and so it turns down the the appetite center and your brain says okay great i'm done um so you can't patent that so novo nordisk patented a synthetic glp1 or, or what they what they would call a glp1 agonist so you inject it goes up to your brain and it turns down your appetite and so people do lose weight with it unfortunately they get a lot of side effects side effects are pretty common nausea vomiting diarrhea and that kind of stuff and for many people those side effects subside or maybe they don't have them there are other risks but frankly the, the big experience that you that, that most people discover is they lose weight and they lose weight and they lose weight and they think this is amazing this is great oh wait a minute it's stopping it's stopping it's stopping i'm not losing any more weight i'm not where i want to be exactly um, my appetite is suppressed. I'm not sure if I'm eating healthy food or not, but I'm just here now. Okay, and the price tag is $15,600 per year. That's the, the current price in the US. And now, if I stop paying that, that weight comes back. So the rest of your life, you're just paying protection money, hoping that the, the weight will not come back and not ever being where you really want to be. And you're not learning about the healthful foods that can that can help you. You're not getting any of these other real benefits. Now, now don't get me wrong. I, I am prepared to believe that there are individuals with rare genetic uh, polymorphisms where maybe this is the right choice. Um, however, for the vast majority of people, if you took $15,600 a year, you could see a dietitian every week for the whole year. You could get a bag of groceries. You could get a gym membership. You could have vacation money um, and you would have so much support for being on a healthful diet. And if you do the numbers, if you take a person who has been on a long-term plant-based diet and a person who has been on long-term semaglutide, the weight loss is about the same <laughs> for the two or, or better with the plant-based diets. I'm talking about people who have really done this for a long period of time. So plus, I mean, what we're doing is so much more fun and interesting with, with food. And and Blue Cross Blue Shield um, did an interesting study because they've been nervous. All the insurers are nervous that if the law requires them to pay for it, how are they going to explain this to their subscribers? Every 1% of subscribers on one of these drugs raises everybody else's monthly premium by $14.50. So you think, wait a minute, let's say there's just 100 subscribers in my group and one person starts this. And now everybody's paying 14 bucks more a month. What if two people started or five or 10? And in North Carolina, just a month or two ago, the state of North Carolina, which had offered this for their state employees, they had lost $100 million. And they said, we just can't do it. And my hope is that we could say, wait a minute. A couple generations ago, obesity wasn't this massive issue that we are having now. It's a question of the wrong foods have come into our culture and the wrong attitude. And, and frankly, I'm going to blame things like cheese and chicken wings and, and things that we all get kind of hooked on, but they don't love us back. So anyway, I think we can get on a different course than, than, than these injections as the answer. Mm, no, you're exactly right. And the side effects can be pretty harsh on some individuals, but then you also have, you know, loss of muscle mass. We're not ad addressing the mental component of this, the mindset of, you know, so many things, uh, feeding emotions and such. But um, yeah, so what are your thoughts, Stephanie, on, you know, have you had people come through your program that have potentially, you know, tried the medications, get weight, or maybe even had surgery to lose weight and then still struggled? I have definitely seen um, a, a, a few people that have been on Ozempic. They, they flatline in the program. They lose their appetite. Things aren't moving anymore. They're not feeling as good as they were feeling. So their doctor's telling them to use it. It gets a little difficult to do, you know, encourage them to do this when their doctor's telling them that they need the Ozempic to lose the weight, do stuff like this. So um, what I like to call it is my own Zempic. Mm. We created ourselves. 
Um, I try to remind them that you have the ability to do this yourself. I've been kind of calling it the own Zempic as a little joke because it, it's reminding people, like Dr. Barnard says, we have the ability to make that satiating feeling happy, feel full. Um, but I actually had somebody gain seven pounds on Ozempic. Uh, yeah. So wow. it is not a for sure. I have way more success with people when they're sticking to a low fat plant-based diet, much mm. better success with that so far. Yeah, absolutely. And they feel good and just, it's just more it's sustainable. Fun. For sure. Oh, I mean, know, 15, let, me, let me jump in on let me jump in on that too. One one more thing I, I should mention. Anna Kaliova, who's the endocrinologist who heads up our clinical research studies here at, at the Physicians Committee, did a really cool study. She brought in people and she gave them a meat meal. And she measured their GLP-1. And it really, the meat meal going down their digestive tract didn't really do a lot. It didn't really leave GLP-1 in their bloodstream like it's supposed to. And then she did this exact same study with a plant-based meal and found the GLP-1 peaks. It goes right up uh, about like a, what a medication would do. Um, and what appears to be the case is that the macronutrient makeup of the meal will determine whether you get much GLP-1 or not. And so you have people going through life eating at McDonald's or something like that, they're not really getting the nutrients that their body needs to make an appetite control compound um, automatically. The, the other piece of this is that if we don't learn how foods work and we're just trying to inject the problem away, um, you're missing some of the cool things that foods will do. There, there was a, a really wild study done at Tufts University where they found a side of foods that I had never heard of. They brought in people who um, were healthy folks and half of them, they said, eat white bread and white rice. Uh, the other group, whole grain bread, brown rice. And you know, it's brown because it has the, the fiber on it. The whole grain bread, it's got fiber. And then they did something that my research team is never going to do. And that is they collected stool samples from everybody and they sorted through their stool samples for six weeks and discovered that the whole grain group, there's something about what fiber does in your digestive tract. It acts like a sponge. It's going down your digestive tract. It finds calories you haven't absorbed yet. It picks them up. The fiber carries those calories down your digestive tract and out with the waste and you flush them down the toilet. Now it's not huge. It's about a hundred calories a day that you lose with the high fiber compared to the, the low fiber foods. But I thought, okay, wait a minute. I'm already knocking off a couple hundred calories a day with the appetite taming effect. I'm knocking off another couple hundred with the metabolism boosting effect. And now you're going to trap a hundred more. So think of this. this. This is just the fiber effect. So we've talked about cinnamon. We've talked about blueberries, apples. They have a peculiar appetite controlling effect as well that I can bore you with. Um, but all these different foods have these special effects that they don't tell you about. And Stephanie, you're saying, you know, the doctor doesn't tell them. Unfortunately, the doctor doesn't know. Um, well, what can you say? That's a whole other topic, isn't it, Laura? You and I have talked about yeah. this before. Yeah, I'm the education you, piece. I'm grateful you guys do. I mean, really, this is the greatest part was the validation hearing this, being able to look it up and see the work that was done. Um, the confidence that this gives people to hear this and to see this is really is really huge. So thank you so much for what you're doing. This is this is what people need to hear. Yeah, well, Dr. Bernard is one of the OGs, so we stand on his shoulders amongst yeah, others. Sure. So thank you so much, both of you. Um, well, I'm keeping you, I know we kept to a particular time. So any final words like you'd like to share? I, number one, the book comes out March 26, guys, go get it. It's, I'm assuming available everywhere, Amazon, all the bookstores. Um, it's available for pre-order right now. I hope people will will do it. And and by the way, if people are, if anybody's near Washington, D.C. or wants to come in on that day, Stephanie, you're coming to Washington. We're going to be at the National Press Club, which is the funnest place in town. It is the cool, it's where every president gets roasted. Um, but we're going <laughs> we, to we're roast something else. We're going to roast vegetables. We're going to have food. Dustin Harder will be there. And Chuck Carroll is going to host the party. 
Um, and we are going to have a blast. So if people want to come, the uh, information is at pcrm.org, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, pcrm.org slash events. And I hope people can come. Fantastic. So we'll make sure and put that link um, on the copy, you guys. Um, but if not, if you're just listening, pcrm.org forward slash events. So any final words, Stephanie, that you'd like to share? I just want people to eat their plants off. I want them to order the book. I want them to nourish, to flourish, um, and get that mindset that we don't we don't have to be stuck being sick. We 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 can feel better just one day at a time. Absolutely. And Dr. Bernard, how would you like to wrap up? The one day at a time is such a smart thing. You know, people think I've got to figure out what I'm going to eat 40 years from now. Can I do this forever? Forget that. Just think short term, keep your low beams on, do it now, do it for this week, next week, the next three weeks, whatever, see what the results are like. That'll mean you'll actually do it. And then the future is going to take care of itself. You're going to really love it. So anyway, oh, and the most important thing, or if you don't mind my saying this, I hope people get better. I hope, I hope they feel good. I hope they lose weight. But the more important than all that is to share it to share it. And look what Stephanie did. She shared this with her family. She was a cheerleader. She said, okay, you're, you're going to have a moment of doubt here and there, but I'm going to talk you through it. And Stephanie believes in her family. She treats them like a, an Olympic athlete that they can do it. And if we, if we share it with others, that can mean knowledge, can mean a recipe. It can mean extra brownies, whatever you've got, you know, share it because you're going to save their lives. Mm, no, I think that's a wonderful way. So uh, keep the low beams on. Okay, there's my two phrases. I'm stealing nourish to flow. <laughs> keep your low beams on. I like to tell people, what is this? You have this moment right now. What is the one thing you do in this moment to impact your health and the lives of others? So I think you guys are doing that every single moment of your lives. So thank you from us in the audience in making this incredible book, Dr. Bernard, and sharing your wonderful story. Stephanie, you guys are amazing as always. Thank you, Dr. Marvis. It was an honor to be here, Dr. Barnard. I'll see you next week in DC. Um, thank you guys so much. This is so exciting. Thank you both. Thank you, Lori.